Hello there my good YouTubers, here is another video on the Gentoo Make Conf. Um, this file is pretty much the build brains or the build instructions to your entire Gentoo installation. Um, it's a pretty important file. I think most people that install Gentoo learn that rather quickly. Um, but for those that have looked at it and you know not, you know, endeavoured into uh, Gentoo, this this is you know pretty much for you. Or if you're starting out, interested in Gentoo, and want to get into. Uh, Installing uh, a Gen 2 distribution and playing with it, and, and um, even just getting involved, then then this this video really is for you. Um, but you know, I mean, basically, as I say, the the, the make config is a file with a set of uh, deep instructions inside it, which the emerge uh, package manager. Um, which pulls down the source code, all the tarballs of source, and compiles them, makes them, configures them, and then installs them, and then records them in the updates. Actually, um, it stores them all in in there. So when you want to uninstall something, it you know it knows where to look and it knows what you've got installed and knows what you haven't and it also knows what versions are installed so that the software can you know keep track of all the versions and whatever that's been done to it even if you've modified uh, an application yourself then remade the e-build and re-emerged it it knows that what build that is and it can match it up with the actual portage tree uh, externally and what you've got internally so even though that sounds really complicated and confusing the fact is it does a lot of that all in itself and the make.config is pretty much one of the uh, main files that handles all of that um, this file is located in the etc directory um, followed by the portage uh, directory um, and then you've got make.conf so it's uh, you know it's obviously got a full stop between the make and the conf as such but uh, anybody that refers who's a gentle user is referring to the make.conf file this is generally this is this is what they're talking about um, but put simply, what we've got inside this file is to start with, um, up here we have CF flags, which is the C compiler flags. These are flags passed to the C compiler. And um without sending some kind of instruction to the c compiler the c compiler doesn't know or won't know what architecture or options or optimizations the compiler should compile your program with so it will just generally pick the default um i think the default for the compiler is 486 um might be might be 686 but um basically these optimizations they what they tend to do is they 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 utilize uh cpu instruction sets inside the uh x86 process or even if it's another architecture it'll optimize those um so the the compiler is pretty advanced but you've got to tell it what you want it to utilize the program into and that's what the flags are for and the c at the start is for c uh, the language c and flags being 
you know, the flags to be passed to it. The first name we've got here is Mark Native. Now, Mark Native is a function that was brought in on the um, GCC versions 4.4 and above, if I remember rightly. I think it was 4.4. Uh, don't quote me on the version. I can't remember. Can't quite remember. But um, native actually is an automatic function. It instructs the GCC compiler to do a uh, CPU um, ID, which pulls out all of what is inside the CPU, whether it's SSC one instruction, SSC two instruction, SSC three, SSC four. AES logarithm, you know, and all sorts of different areas. They're all built inside the uh, Intel or AMD processor. And these pull them out. And they, you know, it, it's able to do it automatically. Now, if you've got a Pentium 4, you can change native and put in Pentium 4. And the compiler will then compile everything with the known instructions that are built inside a Pentium 4 processor. If you have a core uh, i7 processor, then you can obviously put the adjacent name in here, for instance, in that, and it will know that. Um, I generally use native because uh, I'm quite happy with the uh, compiler automatically scanning my processor and finding out all of the little bits that it needs to compile with and it generally automatically does it and and then fits it in and and, and compiles the program the next option we have is an option called the o2 okay now o2 is it, well it's an option it's an optimization that's what the o stands for the o stands for optimization you have uh, o and then zero which is the standard so if you did not put o2 uh, as an option here or as a flag let's call it a flag because that's what they are if you didn't put o2 as a flag then what would happen is it would automatically assume o0 so it was as if you did actually typed a zero there instead of a two um, if you put O1 there, that's the first level of optimization. When you put optimization 2 there, it's a second level of optimization, which is actually the norm, or it's the normal optimizations. If you're going to use optimizations, O2 would be the normal optimization to use. That is an optimization O3. O3 is furthermore optimizations, but with optimization i.e. O3 it can cause problems and it can break so you can use O3 but I wouldn't advise to use O3 because it, again in certain situations it could break the binaries they might have incompatibilities bugs you know that have not been ironed out yet will obviously as I say you know become a problem more uh, with um, optimization 3. Uh, there is also an optimization S, which doesn't have a number, it's obviously the, let the small letter S, which is actually an optimization for small binaries. So when you're, you're programming binaries for a mobile device that has not very much memory um, or storage space on it, then OS would be a good optimization level to use there. There's a few others, but you can nip yourself over to the um, GNU, uh, you know, uh, website or whatever, and take a look at what other optimizations there are for the GCC compiler. Um, we won't bother about pipe for now. That's just generally always a, a default to have in there. Uh, again, you can go and look those up. Uh, just a very brief fact that about the GGDB on the end here. This is a debug flag. What it does is it compiles the program with debug data um, or, or debug data as such. 
and where it has pointers all around the program which you know we use to debug a program or we use to backtrace when something goes wrong a fault occurs we've got data that we can jump back onto and go ah we got a point here it bunked out at this point and we can figure out why it broke out that point we've got some form of data to use for investigation um and that's what the, the, the you know is meant by this this ggdb but with that obviously with this extra data that actually gets outputted by the compiler this makes the files bigger it makes the executables bigger everything's bigger and it can take a lot longer to compile um, so it's not time efficient it's not size efficient um, but does give us a method to backtrack when things go wrong um, furthermore then further on we have the CXX flags which are basically the C++ flags so the above is the C flags which is the um, flags for the C language and then we have the flags for the C++ language with the CXX flags which actually is stated just here it's equal to the CF flags so it basically takes everything that is here in the CF flags options into this variable of CF flags which is what that is there uh, which is what emerge searches for it reads the looks for the CF flags variable and read what reads what's inside it and what we've put inside it is these options then this section at the bottom here is doing exactly the same it's reading what's inside the CF flags variable and then sending them into the CX flags or the C++ flags um, and then that works for the C uh, language and the C++ language that we're going to be compiling on the Gen 2 Linux box furthermore we have uh, further down is C host which is the or chost as they some people put it which is actually what architecture the compiler is going to be compiling the binaries what host as in the host is the computer system what is it going to be compiling it into what architecture is it going to be in my case it's an x86 underscore 64 bit um, uh, which is in one of my previous videos we were talking about um, the x86 64 and AMD 64 basically what this is is exactly the same thing um, it's just obviously to say AMD got to the market first so most of the areas and architectures we all label as AMD 64 but the actual host system is they're both x86 64 it's just the naming convention that you know ended up that way because AMD were the first to market 64-bit chip commercially for the PC desktop um, furthermore we have uh, the obviously the the, the PC Linux dot GNU, which basically all it does is state again the exact architecture, which is basically taken from there. So obviously, as I say, it's a P PC running the Linux GNU operating system, which is pretty simple. It gives it the good instruction. It's you know self-explanatory in itself, really. The further point that I've got here is if you're going to use GGDB you should really be considering putting in features equals split debug now what this does here is the uh, emerge uh, package manager will split the debug data from the compiled program and put the debug data separate to the program so the program still remains small to the running system but gives all of the debug data in a sort of a separate folder if you want to put it that way um, so this 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 helps with optimization or whatever but it does not improve the time it takes to compile the the uh, the program it's still going to take a long time to compile the program while this is on because it's having to compile all the debug data with it um, this all this does is basically just split the debug data from the binary 
so that you know you can you, you look it up you know in different places when you need to and not actually have it all in one place with the binary itself making you know possibly even making the binary run slower um, so this is what this is so it's a, it's a good idea if you're going to be using a ggdb as a as, as a um, optimization flag that you put the split debug in there to do it next we look at use flags which is the next area down in my uh, you know config file as you can see it's quite extensive um, there's a lot of things here we've got everything from image magic IP version 6 Jabba uh, jingle JPEG JPEG 2000 KDE Kerberos contact all of these are use flags and programs to instruct the emerge package manager that we want to use these we've also got SSE 3 down here we've got SSE SSE 4 uh, we've got actually SSE 4.1 there, uh, SSE 4.2. Uh, we've got a multitude of different use flags, and these use flags, what they do is they instruct the compiler and the emerge uh, package manager to uh, install these features with the applications that use them. For instance, we've got uh, let's let's I don't know let's just have a look at one here we've got uh, VLC this basically instructs it to any program that you know has options to be optimized with the VLC media player it will enable the VLC parts of the software so that it will work seamlessly with VLC we have other you know areas where we've got cups which is the print managing uh, print managing drivers to manage your printers on the system so every application that gets compiled on this gen 2 system is going to be uh, compiled and installed with support for cups we also have uh, another one which is probably most common for many people is MMX. Um, everybody who knows that the MMX was a, a an Intel uh, optimization instruction set uh, which came out, I think, started on a 166 megahertz uh, Pentium processor, but was more commonly found on the 200 megahertz uh, Pentium processors. So, you know, this instruction set basically means that, you know, any application that I compile on here that will support and utilize the MMX will be compiled and it will utilize the MMX. Um, you know, we've got other things like, you know, SE Linux, which is the security uh, Linux uh, sort of, uh, you know, layer that, that runs on, you know, for security on Linux. Uh, this will be enabled in every piece of software that's installed on this system globally um, to use uh, SE Linux. Now, you think, well, if you don't want something installed on here, well, what you do is you put a minus in front of it. Here is one right here. This here is remote desktop. I don't use remote desktop. I don't have any use for it or any purpose. So I put a little tiny hyphen, which or a minus sign. And there's quite a, obviously quite a few that's coming through here. But the these minus signs here, what they do is they tell the compiler and the emerge uh, package manager that you do not want this particular utilization so it will disable it on its compile so so programs that will utilize this technology will actually not be built with this technology um, effectively not being enabled um, it, it's you know obviously if, the, if, 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 if it's dis if it's not compiled in the program the program is not going to be able to utilize any of that technology or run it um many other areas we've got i've got pax kernel up here which i don't use which i've disabled 
Uh, I've got system D, which I don't use, which I've also disabled support for. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's actually not much that I've disabled support for in here, but as I say, there's, there's two or three. Um, but these are basically use flags, and, and these are the, these are the, in a sense, the, the one of the beauties of Gentoo Linux, because if you don't want things like Pax Kernel or System D or remote desktop, you know, stuff like that. Even if you don't, let's say, for instance, you want to use stay with IP version 4, you don't want to bother with IP version 6, then we're, say, you, I've got IP version 6 here, look. If I want to uh, not bother with that, I would put a little minus sign in front of here, and everything that is IP version 6 enabled would not be compiled with IP version 6 support. Um, so IP version six just wouldn't work on anything that I installed. Um, you know, this is the way you can pick and choose anything and everything that you want the compiler to compile out of the source code. Fortunately, you can't do this with binary uh, already binary built programs because they need extra programming to give you the option to enable or disable something. And because there's that many options sometimes, <coughs> pardon me, or utilization of technology in programs, uh, then there's that many that you literally would, you well, you would end up like um, the about config of Mozilla Firefox. And anybody who's ever been there um, or gone into that to adjust all those features sees this humongously long list of, of just enormously large amount of options somebody would have to program all of that so that you could turn every element inside a program on and off well that's exactly what we're doing here with all of these use flags to turn these elements on or off um, you know depending on what we want these don't expect to be able to write these in just 10 minutes to be honest with you use flags generally grow as you use the system and you you uh, install things on the system and over a period of a year two years three years four years five years or so on and so forth this list of use use flags whether they're enabled or disabled will grow through time um so you know you can go through and pick which ones you want and don't want through uh, the Gen 2 website because they've got a full list of all the use, flag use flags on the Gen 2 website. It's incredibly good. Um, and you can pick which ones you want, which ones you don't want. But obviously, as I say, as time goes by and uh, you know you become more mature or your system becomes more mature, um, you will find that you will be adding, removing, um, you know, not using certain elements of, of things in programs that you don't need and you want or you don't want and so on and so forth and they will be uh, you will you will make those choices as and when they go along but that's that is pretty much sums up the entire of the use flags it is it's, it's briefly as simply as you know enabling or disabling elements of the program before it's compiled that's exactly what this is Furthermore, we have a, a further important aspect, which is the make options. Now, make options is a very interesting option in, in uh, particularly Gen 2. It is used on the command line when you use the GCC compiler on the command line. And, you know, it, it can become quite important, especially when you've got uh, several processes in a system, this and the other, that you want to utilize to speed up compile times. So make options is a very interesting, uh, you know, option. And the rule of thumb to set the number. Now, minus J is just the, uh, in a sense, it's the parameter that the GCC compiler knows. It goes, oh, minus J. Oh, now we know how many threads to compile, followed by the number. And obviously, as I say, that's the number following it, which will equal the amount of simultaneous compilations. So if you have 500 processors, what you would put in here is 501. 
Now, why would, if you've got 500 processors, why on earth would you put 501 in there? Well, the reason is, this is the rule of thumb with make options. It is always the amount of cores you have or processors that you have plus one. So if you have, say, five cores on one processor and five cores on another processor, you technically, your system has 10 cores in total. So the value you'd put in here would be 11 because it's the total amount of cores that you have in a system that the compiler is going to use plus one. Always add one on the end of how, how many physical cores you have. Obviously, in my system, I have 24. So hence, the number here is 25, because it's 24 physical with one extra thread. Hence, 25. So this is the make options, and this will run 20... Uh, five simultaneous threads all at the same time through obviously each individual core and that would be 24 cores the furthermore here we have the very important now these are important you, you put these in when you actually install uh, Gen 2 Linux I've got another two down here and I've got another two up here but basically what they are is this is the R sync when you want to update the portage tree, you have a local portage tree and a remote portage tree. The remote portage tree is updated on the Gen 2 servers. And everything that happens when a new update's out or a bug release has been fixed uh, or something like that, it gets put into the mirrors and so on and so forth and then updated on the um rsync servers and then what we then do is we use the rsync servers by typing emerge hyphen hyphen rsync and this then goes to the rsync server which is listed here again this make.config is the instruction uh, file it's the instruction config file to instruct where it should go to get things and it'll go to this 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 place here and it'll pull down the updated list of all of the uh, available packages or available um, how can we put it the available updated portage list it will then copy all of the available now new updated listings and it will copy them to your portage your local storage portage on your hard drive after that is done you then run the emerge update uh, command which is actually you use world if you want to update just the system files then you you, you type in um, emerge uh, update system and it will actually just update the system files. If you want to update everything, then you we you use what we call world. You want to update your entire world on your hard drive. So therefore you type in emerge update world. Now when it does that, it, it looks in the updated synced portage tree finds out what needs to be downloaded, checks if it, it is actually on the hard drive. If it's not on the hard drive, then it uses this here, which is the FTP mirror service, to go to and fetch the source code. And then it downloads the source code into your portage on your local storage. Then it obviously follows the build process and everything else that's set out up here, including the the uh, host architecture, including the optimization flags that have been set up there. Builds the applications and installs them and does everything else for you, um, which is pretty simple. So these these two are you know fairly important. This is your in a sense your updates to the outside world. The next areas we have is a option or a, a parameter here that's called video underscore cards, which then equals 
what video card you've got now if you've just got nvidia and the only thing you're ever going to be doing is using the nvidia driver then you can just put nvidia in here and forget that you know the, the rest that i've got i though have here i have video for linux which is v4l then we have vmware now i use the vmware graphics driver so I've put that in here to be included so that programs can utilize using the VMware graphics driver, whatever. So it knows to, the compiler knows to compile that and configure the programs to actually uh, have this, you know, driver, you know, work with applications that will utilize it. Same goes for the advanced power management driver and also same goes for the virtual box driver which is over here um and that's that's basically what that does but it knows anything any application that you all install in your system if it has a video card section if it's going to use a graphics driver then it will have an option and it will search for this video cards equals or video underscore cards equals and then it will read whatever else is in there to see what drivers you want enabled and it will compile the support for these drivers the next area is obviously input drivers and it works exactly the same as video card drivers in my case i just use evdev which is a automatic detection uh software which detects your mouse and keyboard so everything that you know is going to be compiled in the software is going to be compiled with evdev support so it's automatically going to detect my mouse and keyboard uh, Linguas is exactly the same again this is for options where sensitive uh, language data is going to be needed whether it be a spell checker or whether it be uh, you know a keyboard driver it's going to know what language you want to compile the software with it's a waste of the time compiling it in every single language existent on the planet because you're never going to use it how much space is that going to take up on your hard drive how much compile time is it going to take up it's going to be a complete waste so the linguas is a way of defining and specifying i only want english great britain and english um, I believe just the standard EN is actually English US. I have it in there anyway, as I say, it gives me English, Great Britain and English US, which, you know, is fine for me. They are the languages that I speak, they're the languages that I work with. This section here, we're going to, I'm going to leave for another video. This is a section, as I say, I'm going to do a video on the layman overlays but this is a separate make.config as you can see which defines something else which is another configuration file exactly like this but for something else and that is what we call overlays um, which is where we can pull in beta software and we overlay it over the top of the standard um, software library that is stable um so this is this is this is for another more advanced video so i wouldn't worry about that quite yet if you've got something like this in your make.config and you don't know what it is then i would suggest that you um comment it out and when we comment things out in the config files we basically just use the hash okay when we hash it that's it the compiler it won't read it as valid it'll read it as if it's just a load of text like you've wrote something there to you know a comment as we call it in programming um obviously i want it in there so i'm not going to leave that 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 uh, that hash you know uh, in front of the in front of that line but that's basically what it is and that's obviously for another video now this grub platforms part down here again i wouldn't worry about because as i say this is this this was me working on you know a project i think this came in on some update or whatever that i was messing with so this this is this is something else again you don't have to worry about now this is the last one of the of, of the file before we'll call this video a night is that accept underscore licenses this is a very important command now you this is this is your own choice and decision what you choose with these things but this is exactly what it is some software that we can install um on the gnu linux platforms 
Um, and you can store it on any, any, any of them. This is the same. None of the GNU operating systems are limiting in any way. They don't pop up and say, oh, you've got to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing the other. Um, although this is probably one of the most annoying things that I have seen in the GNU Linux world over the past you know, 20 years of being in it, it has become to exist. We have things like the Oracle Java engine, which is the runtime binaries and the Java development kit and etc. These things cannot be installed automatedly. And the reason why is because as you try to install them, they will pop up on the screen and annoy the crap out of you by saying, do you agree to the license terms? Do you, if you disagree with the license terms, we're going to uninstall this and you can fuck off. Um, or, you know, we've got an area where you agree or, or and you, it will carry on installing. Um, stuff like that. But it will pause and it will ask you yes or no regarding installing the application or not now to get over this or get past this we put in a option here which is called accept licenses equals we've got a multitude of options here we can put we can put yes we can put a star in here which is it's like accept all licenses no matter what the no matter what it's asking just get on with it and it will just get on with it um or we can put in no so it rejects all licenses by default doesn't matter what it does it just rejects the license and says no bugger off don't want anything to do with you you're not coming into my system go away bye bye see you later um you have the choice to put whatever you want here and then you know it, it generally takes that decision and 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 and, and does it for you um, I've put a star in here so that it pretty much just goes through and just doesn't bother me. Uh, that not might be the option for you. And this is why the make.config file is actually an important file for you to think and consider what it is that you, wh where you want to be with your system and where you want the um gen 2 compilation to be when it's when it when it's done and and, and, and complete um uh, furthermore these last two that we've got on the bottom here as i say these are uh there's another mirror here which is an r sync mirror and this one here is pretty much exactly the same as what's up he up here um the these are just different r sync servers think these ones are my old uh that one's my old rsync server which i haven't removed yet um that's another one there and this one's a gen 2 mirror rsync which is also an rsync so i'm not too sure what i'm quite doing with with you know with followers but you really only need two one should be the rsync and the other one should be your ftp uh, which is where your packages are fetched from. There is an application which the Gentoo handbook does describe to you uh, where you can run and you can do this via a nice nifty little kind of GUI um, or it's a command line GUI uh, that you can use the uh, curse keyboard cursor keys up and down in the spacebar to select you know your, 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 your sinks and what that does is it takes that information you press OK with and it will input it into this file for you um, and uh, then it's as I say it's done so you don't actually have to type this in here um, unfortunately use flags have to be typed in manually you have to type these in the manual that's why they grow with time and they do grow with time um, the CAF flags that you you type in here again you do type these in manually yourself you've got to decide what architecture you've got whether you want to use the automatic which is the native or whether you want to use Pentium 4 if you've got a Pentium 4 uh, or whether you want to use AMD you know or whatever it is that you, you put in here 
I think AMD 64 is actually an acceptable mark uh, flag, compiler flag. Um, but again, don't quote me on that. O2 uh, in the optimization is your safest option. It's the great middle way balance between good optimization and stable performance. Anything over O2, like O3, would could become unstable. Uh, O1, obviously, as I say, it is stable when you go to O1, um, but obviously, say, you don't get that many optimizations. Uh, O0, obviously, is no optimizations, but it is the default, and it is the most stable. O0 is the most stable. It is said to be. Um, obviously, as I say, the GGDB is again your options, and the pipe again is your options. So it's it's something for you to look into and research. But this is what the make.config file is in Gento. There's no big brain science behind it. It might look complicated. It might seem complicated. But as you've quite rightly seen, it can be actually summed up comprehensively in just one video, very easily, very simply. So, anyway, my good YouTubers, have a good one, and I shall speak to you again in the next video. Thank you very much.